So without further ado, I'd like to invite um, or introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Zubi Norhanipa. She is from Malaysia, and she is uh, an assistant professor at um, Putra Malaysia University, and she has been doing a sabbatical with us for the past year, and this is one of the projects she's been working on. Uh, so Zubi, take it away. Dr. Shara for moderating this session. A very good morning to everybody. Today I'll be presenting on transverse abdominal spleen block, how and why every MIS surgeon should perform this pain reducing procedure. This is the outline of my presentation. Traditionally, opioid has been used as part of post-operative analgesic, and this has led to opioid-related adverse events and to some extent opioid dependence. Therefore, a multimodal approach used using a, a combination of two or more analgesic that acts at different sites within the central and peripheral nervous system in an effort to, be, to minimize pain, minimize opioid usage on any side effects. As part of the multimodal analytic strategy, adding a field block such as transverse abdominal plain block to the traditional local wound infiltration will enhance better analgesic as well as faster recovery in post-surgical patients. Great, Debbie. That's a great introduction. Um, and I want to just jump right in and find out what other surgeons are doing at their sites in terms of local anesthesia. Now, we are logged on right now to the Anne Arundel Medical Center, and I see my colleague, Dr. Park, there. And um, Adrian, can you tell us um, what type of local anesthetics uh, or techniques are you guys using? Are you using tap locks? Are you using local infiltration uh, with, your, with your typical MIS procedures? Well, morning, uh, Phil and Connor et al. Um, my own practice, I'm, I'm working at the diaphragm and above most of the time, so um, not, not much local infiltration for me, but I've asked Dr. Belyansky to weigh in our, our uh, hernia guru and obviously spends a lot more time uh, in and around the transversalis abdominis muscle. Uh, good morning. Uh, so an interesting topic certainly, and uh, typically in our practice we use either 0.25% marking or 0.5% marking. And uh, I personally spent quite a bit of time uh, in the retromuscular space doing a lot of reverse abdominal procedures or restock procedures. And I see the uh, nerve fibers that we block with, uh, uh, with, uh, with our local anesthetic uh, quite a bit. So uh, it's, uh, it's certainly an interesting topic for discussion because uh, uh, while the data supports it, and we certainly have it in our in the colorectal world uh, here, we, as part of our protocol, we do have uh, tap blocks and some things that we end up doing uh, just prior to leaving the operating room. I think, to tell you the truth, I have not seen that much difference unless you want uh, to use something like uh, uh, long uh, term acting, a uh, liposomal, uh, a liposomal uh, a local anesthetic. So, uh, you know, I'm curious to listen to your lecture and see what your experience has been. In my anecdotal personal experience, I have not seen that much difference in uh, patient outcomes, uh, at least in my practice, when we're using it locally. Okay, great. Thanks for your input. So it sounds like you're not totally sold on this tap watch, so uh, Zoom does convince him, okay? But before you go on, let me hear from a couple other sites real quick here. Let's go to uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, Weston. And let's see what the guys at uh, Cleveland Clinic. I don't know if Steve is there or Raul or Sam. Yeah, hey, hey good morning. So I'm, I'm here, and uh, David Mann is actually uh, in the presence of William on this one. Okay, real quick, what are you using? Yeah. We're using Marking. We're using Marking. Uh, we're using marking. Um, we've not used like a similar encapsulated Marking, just uh, standard Marking. And we found. Uh, in contrast to the, the previous speaker, we, we found a, a significant difference in the, in the post-operative pain level patients who get the tap blocks. Um, but we tend to do them uh, uh, preemptively, so we'll do, as soon as the patient is uh, induced, we'll do it with the uh, use of ultrasound uh, before we start the procedure rather than at the end. We, we've seen a significant difference. Okay, great. So a thumbs up, um, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Florida. And you guys are using the ultrasound technique, and we're going to demonstrate a laparoscopic approach, which we think is easier actually for surgeons. Let's quickly go to Florida. Mm -hmm. Our colleagues.
colleagues in Florida, I don't know if Dr. Steve Eubanks is there or his colleagues. I'd like to hear what they're doing in terms of uh, local anesthetic usage. There, Steve. Hey, Steve, good morning. Good morning, Phil. How are you? We um, are currently, it's really individualized to the surgeon. Through most of my career, I preferred using a paravertebral block, and we would use that routinely during my duty days because we had multiple anesthesiologists who really loved doing the paravertebrals. There are a couple of problems with doing paravertebrals, one of which is you do have to have skilled anesthesiologists who are willing and ready to be efficient to get these blocks done. Secondly, most of the time they will do these under propofol, and so you do have some airway risk during the time that the block is being performed, which is usually in the pre-op holding area, and then the transport of the patient to the operating room. So you can have respiratory problems during that. But we actually found, as far as pain relief, the paravertebrals were more effective than a tap block. Again, that could be experience levels or the person actually administering the block. So currently, because we have very few people who are willing to put them in for us, we will use quarter percent marcaine at each wound site, but we're certain to get down to the fascial level and really do a field block at each trocar site as opposed to just skin infiltration. And we perform that at the end of the operation. Great, Steve. We'll get back to you on that and to try to compare and contrast the different uh, techniques, that paratypical block versus this laparoscopic delivered approach. Let's hear from some other sites real quickly. Let's go to Johns Hopkins real quick and then we'll have Lily uh, continue with her presentation. Uh, Elisa Coker, new faculty here at Hopkins, by the way. Um, so we've been using tap blocks pretty routinely. I actually rolled it out as part of an advanced uh, recovery pathway for all of our bariatric patients. Uh, additionally, uh, I think many of us use them for a lot of our uh, laparoscopic ventral hernias. And we've had really good success with those. I think it's a really easy thing that you can add on. It doesn't take much time. So we Great. Are you doing it laparoscopically? Or are you having the anesthesia colleagues help you do that? Or are you doing ultrasound? Or? You know, it's been kind of a combination of both. Uh, on our bariatric patients, we definitely do it ourselves. Um, and there's been some variation in techniques upon practice between practitioners. Some of us do it uh, intraperitoneally uh, with a, a long laparoscopic needle um, like you would use to drain a gallbladder and then some of us just do it externally while watching uh, the infiltration. Um, and then there are some cases depending on the setting and how quickly your anesthesia colleagues can accomplish the task that will let them do it. Okay, great. So folks, you've heard a lot of different approaches um, in half a dozen or so centers throughout the country and across the globe. So let's hear more about this technique. So what is transverse abdominal spleen block? It's actually a field or regional anesthetic technique that has been used for post-surgical analgesia of the anterolateral abdomen. The anesthetic drug is injected between the internal oblique and transverse abdominal muscle, just deep to the fascia plate where the sensory nerve runs. The innervation of the anterolateral abdominal wall arises from the anterior rami of the spinal nerve, P7 to L1. And TAP block provides analgesia for skin, muscle, fascia, and parietal peritoneum. It does not have an visceral block. It's usually given bilateral due to some crossing over the fibers over the midline. The indication of TAP block is actually as an alternative to the epidural anesthesia for larger abdominal incision, both open and laparoscopic. Originally, it was mainly used for global abdominal procedures, including inguinal hernia repairs, appendectomy, colorectal resection, total abdominal hysterectomy, caesarean section, and prostatectomy. But currently, more and more upper abdominal surgery are being using tap lock, such as for laparoscopic cholecystectomy and bariatric procedures. TAPLOG is contraindicated in patients who have bleeding disorder or those who are on, oral, uh, on chronic anticoagulation therapy and those who have lumbar hernia. Complications of TAPLOG include liver and bowel injury, hematoma, intravascular injection, and anesthetic related complications such as overdose or allergic reactions. What are anesthetic drugs that can be used for TAPLOG? include robivacaine, buvacaine, and the newer agent with the longer acting liposomal buvacaine. However, those, those studies has been comparing the efficacy of that block with these different anesthetic drugs. So there are three main techniques that that block can be performed. 
The first one is the loss of resistance or the landmark technique, ultrasound guided or the laparoscopic guidance. Loss of resistance is performed as a blind technique at the triangle of the tip with the lower border between the lower border of the intercostal margin, costal margin and the iliac crest at the mid axillary line. The needle is introduced at the right angle between the coronal plane, the first resistance of the fascia of the external oblique, and then the second resistance of fascia is the internal oblique. So when we feel the second pop, this is the plane that the transverse abdominal fascia where the local anesthetic that's injected. The landmark for ultrasound guided tap block is similar to the, the similar to the landmark technique, but however in this case we use a high frequency ultrasound probe that is placed between the iliac crest and the um, costal margin to get the layers of the muscle. And needle is then penetrated at the facial level between the internal oblique and transverse abdominis. The local anesthetic then injected at the transverse abdominis plane. And the final technique is the laparoscopic tap block, which is also done similar way at the landmark of the skin, where it's between the costal margin and the iliac crest at the mid axillary point. But we use a laparoscopic to view the transverse abdominal strain from the, from the inside of the abdomen, where we, when we inject the anesthetic drug, we're supposed to see a nice bulge of the transverse abdominal muscle into the abdominal cavity. So in laparoscopic traverse abnormal plane block, if the block is done correctly, the local anesthetic should be nicely injected into the transverse abdominal plane, giving a nice bulge. Laparoscopically, we will, where you see the transverse abdominal muscle smoothly bulging into the anterior abdominal cavity. But in some instances, you tend to have techniques that's done wrongly whereby the, the needle goes beyond the peritoneum and causing the local anesthetic to be injected into directly into the abdominal cavity or the needle goes into the preperitoneal space and the local infiltration got infiltrated at the preperitoneal space. These are the most two common techniques that goes wrong when the block is done incorrectly. Okay, so uh, you've seen a uh, detailed video and some technical pearls. And what I'd like to do is get some feedback uh, from some of our colleagues. Uh, first off, with my colleague, Dr. Delaney, who actually introduced me to this concept. So, Connor, uh, give us some of your pearls. Um, so, we started looking at this, uh, Phil, about seven years ago now. Um, and we've done, Steve Eubanks was mentioning about the, you know, the different sites of installation, and we've done a couple of cohort studies, and we found that intraperitoneal or port site weren't changing anything for us for lap colon. So started using tap blocks, um, but the way I was shown, actually when I was visiting Colchester um, a long time ago, they did it just by a blind pop technique, and it just seemed a little bit too random for me. So it came home and we started doing it by an ultrasound guided technique, but it just took a little bit too long, depending on the anesthesiologist, and always added about half an hour. So I thought of doing it laparoscopically. So we published those data in 2013, and they were the first time we got our length of stay down to 23 hours after a laparoscopic colon resection. There have been a few patients before that, but we moved it from 4% of patients going home at 24 hours to about 20% going home at 24 hours. And this probably was the biggest single change in our care paths. And then we followed it up with a number of studies, including a randomized controlled trial where we showed they significantly reduce uh, pain, opioid utilization, etc. They alone didn't seem to change length of stay. That was probably in association with high dose oral Tylenol. And then a couple of other studies have come out. Actually, there was a very nice one that came out in the last couple of months in JAX uh, from a Dr. Park et al. from Korea. And they actually randomized patients having this laparoscopic technique now against ultrasound guided and showed no difference. So I agree with you. I think the laparoscopic technique seems to be robust. It's got good outcomes. We just use two sites and not multiple sites because it seems to spread out very well in the planes. And I haven't used uh, liposomal bupivacaine because it's an extra $300. And I think we've just secured funding from the company to do a randomized control trial on it to see if it's better than plane marking. But I think it's a great technique. Great. I noticed that from a technical point of view, in the colorectal, they typically just do the two sites, the two lateral sites at the Pettit's uh, triangle. 
And it seems no, the lower, lower arc, yeah, about anterior to mid axillary line. Okay, yeah, right, yeah. right. And that seems to do pretty well from mid to lower. But many of us who do Forga have found that these you know, upper intercostal nerves, T7 through T10, um, often you know, come across the upper abdomen and may not necessarily be adequately sure. covered by that. So this may be... Yeah, no, I think you probably need to put one higher, yeah, or multiple, right. as you do. Right. Now, are you guys using this pretty much on all of your colorectal cases? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's almost, so now across the department, there's 22 here at main campus, and I'd say about two-thirds are using it now. Right. Now, as opposed to the blind technique, do you feel that um, uh, this is more directed, and, and do you feel, because you don't actually see it go into the plane, what you see is a bulge of the transverses abdominis, which is a reflection. Do you think that's an adequate visual marker that you're in the right plane? I think it is because of the randomized control trial we published uh, in addition it to works. the cohorts, it, so it works clinically. Uh, I think this recent randomized control trial against ultrasound shows that it works as well as ultrasound. And I think when you've done it a couple of times, as you know, you, just, you see. If you see the needle, it's too deep. If you see a blister, it's too deep. If you see nothing, you're too superficial. And you see this very reproducible bulge in almost every patient. Yeah. And then we just use a Medtronic needle. And every now and again, in really old, frail people, their tissues are so thin, you don't feel any resistance or pop as you go through yeah. the layers. And those, I just tap the needle on an instrument, and it just blunts it a tiny bit, and it allows you feel those planes a little bit better. Very good. What about learning curve? How long does it take to learn how to do this? Two cases. OK. And a typical case, how many minutes, uh, how much OR time is it taking? Because you're doing this in the OR. About two minutes. Two and, minutes. And we do it at the end of every case, so we get the maximum. So we don't use any preemptive blocks. Um, and we do it at the end of every case. And um, that way you've got probably eight hours with marking yeah. starting at the end of the case, so you get the maximum. So that it's functioning by the time they're awake. Um, and uh, you've got the maximum length of, of drug on board. Yeah. Very good. I have to admit that our technique that Zuby just showed, it takes more about 10 minutes or so. And obviously, we're sticking the needle all the way across the upper abdomen, so it does take a little bit more time. But we're finding that it works uh, pretty well. John Rodriguez is here, my other colleague. Can we show, the, uh, show him over there? John, uh, do you have any comments? I know that you're also using a little different technique for gastric bypass, and you're also using uh, a tap block approach, correct? Sure. So I use a very similar approach as the one that you described. Um, but I think in terms of technical pearls, you know, I think it's great Connor shared his experience and I'm, you know, it takes you two minutes but I've done a few hundred of these. But I think when you're starting early in your learning curve, I like to do it as part of the initial kind of setup of the case. Because I think to do it right, especially as you're learning, it takes time and you're more prone to invest the time to do it right at the beginning of the case. The other problem I've noticed when you try to do it at the end of the case is that especially if you're doing like, you know, like a strectomy or something, you're struggling with the new at the end after taking your specimen. I think you're more prone to just kind of, you know, try to do it quickly and not do it right. So I think when you're starting early in your learning curve, it's been very useful to do it at the beginning of the case, take the time to do it right. And, and similar to your uh, description, I think it takes a good five to ten minutes to do it uh, across the uh, costal margin all the way down to the uh, is this technique, and for both of you guys, is it pretty easy to, to teach uh, residents and fellows how to do this? Absolutely. Okay. And I have to admit, our, uh, all our fellows are over here, they usually do the technique, and so um, it doesn't really take that much time and effort to learn to learn this. Very good. So um, let's hear more about uh, the results of studies. Do you want to tell us what the literature says about this technique uh, we've reviewed? So clinical accounts of that block versus local wound infiltration. Uh, local wound infiltration plus that block versus local wound infiltration in a laparoscopic colorectal surgery and ERAS program. The 48 patient who had laparoscopic colectomy had a that block at the end of the surgery using ultrasound guided and 24 patient in each arm. A that block was given with 20 mils of robivacaine bilaterally on top of the local infiltration. Yes. All the patients routinely got a continuous IV tramadol or IV paracetamol 1 gram TDS. Big 2 pain was controlled with IV catarolot or IV tramadol 100 mg or morphine 3 mg. Routinely all patients got IV zofran. So the result shows that the TAP block group who received 
tap log and local infiltration had less nausea and it was significantly compared to the local infiltration group. And the time taken for the plastic platers, removal of urinary catheter and also diet advancement was much, much significantly than the tap block group as compared to the local infiltration group. As for energetic consumption, both group, both total energetic and total opiate consumption was lower in the tap block group. But as for total, it was significantly reduced in total opioid in the tap block group as compared to the local filtration group. Generally, the pain score was much lower in the tap block group as compared to the local wound infiltration, but however, it was not statistically significant. So in conclusion, tap block with local wound infiltration in laparoscopic colorectal surgery with ERAS program has reduced use of opioid with good pain control, thus allows improvement of essential items of the enhanced recovery pathway. That's a randomized control style uh, then there is a systemic review and meta-analysis on tap block for post-operative analgesic, 51 randomized control trials, whereby 36 of them had tap block using ultrasound guided, 12 of them had low re loss of resistant tap block, and three of them had a tap block performed inside the abdomen after an open surgery. So the this part, majority of the cases were uh, obstetric and gynecological. And we have colorectal cases, appendectomy, inguinal hernia, three studies showed bariatric surgery, liver resection, gastrectomy, and urology cases. Majority of them had a single injection tap block, and most of them had, had the tap block performed before the surgery. So the result shows that tap block complex to the placebo, all of the three methods actually showed reduced 24 hours opiate consumption. And the forest plot of showing the pain score at six hours was favoring tap block as compared to the placebo with a reducing pain score by 1.4 and a 12 hours pain score reduced by two. Forest plot showing the 12 hour pain score in the appendectomy and inguinal surgery was favoring tap block as compared to the <coughs> control group which was receiving either saline, no block or illo inguinal nerve block. So in summary of the RCTs, there was a reduction in pain score and morphine consumption in the tap block group after gynecological surgery, appendectomy, inguinal surgery, bariatric surgery and urological surgery. In the tap block, Therefore, it concluded that tap block can play an important role in the management of pain after an abdominal surgery by reducing both pain score as well as the 24-hour morphine consumption. There's another study that compared the laparoscopic versus ultrasound guided tap block in a laparoscopic, as a post-laparoscopic cholecystectomy pain relief. It's recently published this year. It was using a tap block of 20 mils of vivacaine bilaterally at the subcostal region and both arms has 30 patients each and the tap block was done just before the surgery. All patients received IVI morphine intraoperative as an intraoperative analgesic and PCA opioids as postoperative analgesic. There was no significant difference between the laparoscopic tap block versus ultrasound guided tap block in terms of pain score at 6 hours, 24 hours, or 48 hours, or there was no difference in the morphine consumption in both the groups, and there was no difference as post operative nausea and vomiting. However, there was time taken to perform tap block was much lower, faster in those who were using laparoscopic guided tap block as compared to ultrasound guided and was statistically significant. So in conclusion, laparoscopic tap block was is faster and equally as effective as compared to ultrasound guided tap block. So the take home point is, Chambers abdominal strain block is easy to perform, safe, 
has less opioid usage and opioid-related side effects. It can be used as an adjunct to multimodal pain management. Optimal timing for tap blood depends on the technique of tap blood that's used. It can be done as induction, before incision, or at the end of the procedure. Laparoscopic tap blood is easy and as effective as ultrasound guided. It requires a shorter time to perform and can be given with multiple injections along the transverse abdominal plane. As for ultrasound guided tap blood, you're able to visualize the plane well, but it, however, it takes a longer time to perform and you need an ultrasound in the operating room. As for the low, loss of resistance, it's a blind method and you can only use it as a, for single injection. Okay, dude, that was fantastic. Now, in just a minute, I want to hear from some of our other sites, and we're going to start in just a minute with Stony Brook. Then we're going to go to Dalhousie. We're going to go to Ohio State. We're going to go back to Cleveland Clinic, uh, Florida. It's really uh, pretty impressive. 51 randomized trials with a pretty high degree of consensus showing a benefit. And then the last study you showed that the laparoscopic approach was equivalent to the ultrasound approach in terms of its accuracy. So pretty strong evidence that this technique actually works. So let's go to Stony Brook. I see uh, my colleague Roy Pryor. Hi, Roy. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Phil? Good. What do you think about this? I think it's great. We tried it with the anesthesia team doing it. And for me, that slowed down our case. So doing it laparoscopically makes a lot more sense. But Dino, my partner here, has a question for us this morning. So, um, great, great, great topic today. Is this a billable procedure for the surgeon? Uh, that's that's one question. And the other is, you, you mentioned using this um, for for a, uh, some time now in the clinic. Have you seen any specific results in terms of uh, either cutting length of stay or since we started a multimodal analgesia program for our patients? Mo I would say 80 plus percent go home the next morning. Uh, so I'm just trying to see how that would fit in our in our process. But very uh, very good videos and great uh, results. Great. So two great questions. I knew the uh, is this billable question would come up. I knew that. <laughs> I I know for sure when it's done um, by the anesthesiologist using ultrasound, it is a separate billable. There's a CPT code for that. But when a surgeon combines it with a procedure, that's a little bit, you know, up in the air in terms of uh, billing and getting uh, reimbursement. Ricardo, do you have a comment about that? Yeah, actually it's not up in the air. You can't bill for it. You cannot. You cannot bill for it. So that's why if you do it and the technique takes two minutes, it's, it works well. <laughs> it's kind of not fair, right? <laughs> it's kind of not fair that we don't bill for it. But it only takes two minutes at the end of a case. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's for the colorectal surgery because you're much faster than us. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all about, it's all about value. The, the other point um, was about uh, are we seeing um, a difference in length of stay? Now, we're actually conducting a randomized trial until our results are not um, available yet. But I can tell you, just from an observation point of view, um, it was pretty rare that we'd get a gastric bypass patient out the next day. But since we started doing the TAP block, we're getting a fair number of our gastric bypass patients. I would probably say 25 to 30% are going home the next day. Now, we're also using other ERAS techniques, too, which are probably making a big impact. But we really think the TAP block is, is a major contributor. And would you agree, Connor? Connor is a big guru of the ERAS concept. Is this a big thing for ERAS? So certainly having done it for 17, 18 years now, it's been our biggest single change. But there's no good evidence in the literature about any single component uh, for enhanced recovery. Um, but you know, if it's two minutes, it costs us. If you include the needle and marking, it's $12. Um, and you're reducing opioid utilization and pain scores. So there's no reason not to do it. Yeah. Good point. Let's hear some from the other side. Let's go to uh, uh, Canada, Dalhousie, and Nova Scotia. If they're still on online. There we go. So, uh, good morning. Good morning. Hi, uh, I'm Lucy Hellier. Can you hear us? Yeah, you can, yes. Uh -huh. Perfect. Hi, I'm a surgical oncologist. So, we've been using um, tap locks for open surgery. And um, we've been using it for our sugar radiators, um, large midline incisions, and actually floating an epidural catheter in the space and using them um, over the next several days for um, local incisions. 
it's got our, some patients have a card in their products. Um, and it's really important to public AR um, today that these very complicated patients. So I think that uh, the more um, that we can do with this, uh, with, with these blocks and uh, these cohorts that. So that's great. So you're talking about adding an, uh, a, a catheter into the space, correct, with continuous infusion. And there are some commercial devices out there that facilitate that. Yes. And do you feel it gives a, a longer lasting effect? It does. Um, uh, most patients, uh, some patients don't actually require any narcotics through their uh, hospitalization. So these are uh, very expensive um, peritonectomies, multivisceral resections, um, line incisions, and uh, in their case, you know, their pain scores are extremely low um, with this uh, technique. So we hope we run the infusions for uh, three days, um, up to five days, and as soon as they come off the infusions, they require small amounts of narcotics a day. So, uh, but it has really helped. Great. Thanks for sharing that with us, Connor. Do you have any comment about this continuous infusion approach? Yeah, so if you look at the literature um, around the continuous infusion trials, there isn't really good support for doing it. But I think there's people who have experience, just like we heard from Dalhousie, especially when you're doing these open uh, stoma type procedures, you're in the space, you can put a catheter in, and it probably needs a good study, but the empirical evidence is actually quite good. Very good. So another technique to consider. So let's hear from some of our other colleagues. Let's go to Ohio State. Um, I saw Brad Needleman earlier on the online. And hey Brad, good morning, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Yeah, it's good. Really fantastic actually that every site seems to be doing chat blocks. We've been doing it here on all of our bariatric cases for the past three or four months or so as part of our ERAS protocol and participating in the energy protocol for bariatric surgery. And the other group that tends to use it is our uh, robotic hernia program. They seem to do it with anesthesia um, preoperatively, and we're doing it laparoscopically postoperatively. It's been really, I think it's been a great, observationally, it's been a great adjunct to, I think, our ERAS protocol. I think it's really helped our patients get out of bed earlier after surgery. We were just speaking that what we've noticed is uh, a lot more pain from their epigastric ports. And I know the difference in technique between what we do and what I watched in your video is we don't inject subcostally, so we talked maybe about adding that um, to try to help with that uh, epigastric port uh, pain that we're seeing sometimes uh, postoperatively as well. We're not able to get the liposomal components here, so we're just using a uh, quarter percent bupivacaine. He said he diluted it. I was just, I didn't see how much local versus d d saline you use to dilute it. Can you just give us an idea of what ratio you're using to dilute out your... Uh, your local anesthetic? ZB, you want to comment on that? I think you have a slide that <coughs> that shows the amount of there. I think 200 cc's of that, but I didn't see how much of that was local and how much of that was saline. Yeah, a majority of that is you know? saline because it's diluted up quite a bit. So for the liposomal, we uh, can use 20 mils of the 1.3% and we dilute that with uh, 150. Because we add uh, liposomal bubacaine with a shorter acting marking of 30 mils, so it becomes to 50 mils, and then we dilute that with 150 of saline to make it a total of 200 mils. Thank you. Yeah, and the idea behind using the, the bupivacaine mixture with the liposomal bupivacaine is it's a shorter, as a quicker acting element because the liposomal bupivacaine is a, a longer acting. Great, great, Brad. Thanks so much for your comments. Uh, I want to go to, back to Florida, um, Florida Hospital, um, and hear any additional comments from Dr. Eubanks and colleagues, and we'll finish with Dr. Wexner um, at uh, Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Go ahead, Steve. Great. Thank you, Phil. And, you know, I think in your work and the work that Adrian Park does and several of us who are on the call today, when we're working with the foregut space, one of our greatest enemies postoperatively is postoperative nausea and vomiting. It can disrupt everything that we've done. And when you look at the literature of paravertebral versus the top block, you find that in some studies, the postoperative nausea and vomiting rate is double with a top compared to a paravertebral block. 
However, other studies completely reverse that. And my curiosity was around what your experience has been regarding reduction of postoperative nausea and vomiting using this type of block as compared to either another block or no block at all. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Do you, do you want to comment about the effect of this on the nausea and vomiting? I mean, most of the studies, the RCTs that show that the nausea and uh, vomiting scores post uh, tap block is slightly is slightly reduced as compared to the those who are not on tap block. It's probably because the technique that they use and this, when they started using it. But most of these RCTs actually use the continuous infusion rather than a single shot. So it's very, it varies upon the studies. And it also depends, but most of the cases here is done by ultrasound guided compared to the laparoscopic. So we wouldn't know that it's really, I mean, at this point in time, we are doing a randomized control trial comparing this tap log, whether then you really have any effect on the post of nausea and vomiting. But it's still in study, so we haven't have got a conclusion for that. Now, Steve, uh, with this paravertebral technique that uh, you are advocating, that involves anesthesiologists. Um, so does that create a challenge in terms of, you know, managing your cases throughout the day, you know, scheduling your procedure, and I, I suppose this is done in a, you know, a pre, you know, uh, an ante room prior to the surgery. Can you talk to us about that? Is that some more of a deterrent to that approach? So where I work currently, absolutely it's a deterrent, and it does add time to the turnover time between cases. During my time at Duke, we had multiple people who were very proficient with paravertebral blocks, and it showed no delay because they were very, very efficient about taking care of that while you were doing your previous case, or they got in and, and had business taken care of. So there, it did not impact us negatively. We actually began initially doing tap blocks here with anesthesiologists. And that added about 30 minutes to our turnover time because by the time they found their ultrasound and gathered their materials and all this, it just took what was already a, a long turnover time and made it where it was intolerable. And so we moved towards doing our own and trying to eliminate them from the process with that. That's a really good point, Steve. And for those of you out there, if, if you're going to use a, a technique that's driven by the anesthesiologist, it, it can be very successful, but you really have to have you know, the methodology, the logistics worked out. Otherwise, it's not going to fly. It's going to delay your operating time, and nobody wants to do that. So that's a very good point, Steve. Thank you. Now, let's finally go back to uh, Cleveland Clinic of Florida and Steve Wexler. Steve, you have the last word, um, and Steve is gone. <laughs> now, I'm sure he's in your There he is. He's getting some coffee. So are you guys, are you guys going to adopt this technique for colorectal or what? Yeah. Hurry up, Steve. I had to be signing, you know, it's unfortunate, but uh, it's, it's life. So back from sign-in. Uh, yeah, actually, most of the guys are doing it. Um, the thing is that our anesthesiologists rather enjoy doing it. Um, and so in some cases, we let them. It does add time. And I'm sorry I missed part of the discussion. It does add time. And I think more importantly than who does it or how it's done, and I think that was shown beautifully with their uh, detailed review of the randomized controlled trials. I think the important thing is doing it, perhaps more than how you do it. The fact that whether it's by uh, the ultrasound-guided technique or the laparoscopic technique, whether it's the way you do it all along the reward nerve or the way Connor does it after coming back from Colchester, and whether it's the surgeon or the anesthesiologist, I mean, those are the fine-tuning details, and I'm not sure there are vast differences. I think there are strong I think the vast difference is doing it as opposed to not doing it. And so, yes, the team here, as Connor said about the 22 staff in, in Ohio, uh, it is pretty routinely used by our staff here in Florida. Okay, that's great. So it's a great way to, to finish this uh, broadcast. And so the take-home message is, if you're not doing tap blocks, you really ought to think about doing it. And there's lots of information out there on techniques on how to do it. And this is one video we showed you today. And by the way, this video today, or this broadcast, will be archived and available for review in just a few weeks. So if you want to go back and look at this again, it's available on our archived uh, site.